Good afternoon. I was delighted today to be joined by Liz Barkley, small business champion, broadcaster and writer. Most of Liz's broadcasting career has been with the BBC in the Business Programmes Unit, where she worked with Mickey Clark, Declan Curry and Bob Powell, producing radio and TV programmes, pound for pound and 60 small business programmes for BBC Two, for an independent production company and presenting you and yours on Radio 4 for 10 years. She has written three Four Dummies books, including Employment Law for Small Businesses and several business books. Liz works with boards and small businesses on improving governance, trust and culture diversity and customer understanding and is a passion about improving customer service and employee engagement. She coaches communication and presentation skills and chairs national and international conferences. I really enjoyed catching up with Liz, talking about Back in Business, which was launched uh, during lockdown to help small businesses get back on their feet to give more voice to small businesses that are the backbone of this economy. We enjoyed chatting about a number of subjects. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you'd like to ask any questions, please do. And I'll pass them to Liz to get you involved. Good afternoon, Liz. Thank you for joining Good me today. Afternoon. Really nice, absolute pleasure. It's, it's great to see you uh, on, on screen. So we've chatted a little bit on, on, on the phone. Um, there's been lots of great things that have happened this year, initiatives set up, um, despite obviously the horrific year that we've had, and lots of things that have been forced and changed a lot quicker than they would be. Um, so delighted to, to speak to you today, a little bit more about the back, to, back in business that, that you've set up. Um, but uh, you know, you've had a, a great career, wide career in broadcasting as an author, producer, journalist, and obviously you're chair on lots of different groups as well. But the main thing that comes through from reading your, your kind of background and experience is, is the passion for, for small business, the SMEs. And I guess now is, is what's happened, what needs to change, and how do we move forwards from this? So, yeah, I was just interested to hear more about back in business, um, why you started it, and tell me a little bit more about it. Uh, well, as you said, I have realized throughout a varied career that the passion really lies in small businesses. And I think that was a passion born of growing up with parents who ran a farm. They were, in effect, running their own business. Um, and I was used to that as a way of working. And it does give you flexibility, I suppose, in terms of uh, how you set out your day and what else you can fit into it and so on. Um, I don't think I'm a natural employee, to be right. honest. Uh, the temptation is too often to say, hang on a minute, couldn't we do that slightly better and slightly differently? Uh, so I've always worked as a self-employed person. And um, when we came to lockdown, I realized that a couple of my colleagues had inadvertently left their jobs at really inappropriate moments. Right. Um, so Mickey was leaving Wake Up to Money after 20 odd years uh, and therefore his long connection with the BBC was coming to an end. That's Mickey Clark. Uh, he presented Wake Up to Money for 20 odd years. Um, and so I took the opportunity of saying to Mickey, uh, hang on a minute, there's other things that we can be doing here. And another colleague uh, from a, an organisation that represents self-employed people had also left his job around about the end of March. We got our heads together. We spent a, a bit of time thinking. And then I said, right, guys, this is what we're doing. We're setting up this podcast. We will do some blogs, etc. But ideally, what I really want to do is to get small businesses in front of policymakers. Now, that might be MPs. It might be civil servants. It might be organizations that feed into the policymakers. And so... Uh, the belief, the firm belief that this is based on is that there are 8,000 big businesses and there are nearly 6 million small businesses and self-employed people yeah. who don't get enough of a voice and enough of airtime. That's what it's about. Turning the pyramid upside down, getting the small businesses out there to talk to the policy people. No, that, and that's great. I think on your website, is it 54% of, of the businesses in this country, of SMEs? And like they said, the, people say the backbone of the, of the country, didn't they? And I guess during this time, we've seen some of those, those cracks being exposed a bit more where there's the, the gaps of where there's lack of funding, lack of support. And there is an opportunity now to like 
hold those people to account, to make changes, to listen to those voices. And I think it's great what you're doing um, to give those people that voice. Well, one MP said to me last week, you know, we as MPs very rarely get the opportunity to talk to small business people running their own businesses. I did say, well, you probably have quite a lot of small businesses in your constituency. But he said, uh, you know, to be fair, we spend an awful lot of time in our constituencies listening to individuals, etc. And if a small business comes to us, we will, of course, listen. But there are isn't that much in terms of resources to go out there and actively look for small businesses to talk to. Big businesses are much easier to get hold of. Uh, They come voluntarily to talk to government, have the ear of government. And also, uh, as he pointed out, most MPs haven't run their own small businesses. They haven't been self-employed. And so there's a lack of understanding of what the real issues can be at that level especially at the micro level, you know, the zero to nine employees, which is where uh, my interests, I suppose, where my heart really lies. But there are a vast number of those employing about 15% of the workforce, which is huge. Then you've got the self-employed people on top of that, about 4.4 million of those. Between them, they make up a quarter uh, they make up 33% of the workforce. And then you've got the medium sized up to 250 em- uh, employees employing another raft of uh, people right up to around about 60% of the workforce being employed by what we would call small and medium sized enterprises, SMEs. So is this vastly important? And yet all of the broadband, the the bandwidth seems to be taken up by the 8,000 large firms. And let's face it, those 8,000 large firms are dependent on the skills of the freelancers yeah. and, and small businesses, providing them with skills and contracts and services. So we need to look after that backbone of UK, UK PLC. Yeah, no, I think absolutely. And, and the, the, the role that we have, um, say, based here in Somerset, um, is a very good community um, alongside the design side of what, what I do in the, on our magazine, we've run a business networking group. So I've come into touch with lots of lots of people from lots of different backgrounds. And we have a, we have a great uh, Taunton Chamber and Somerset Chamber of Commerce who do lots for The Voice here. But there is there's still little f- sort of fragmented parts of, I say, that, that bigger voice and them having to drive that 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 forward to give them the skills they need. I know when I, my, my business is coming up to 10 years, I think it's February. So I've been kind of looking back, like a lot of us have during lockdown on your business and where you've been. And I think it's that guidance, isn't it? Whether you're a startup or whether you're, say, you're a small business that's maybe looking to take the next step, it's it's having that ease of them being able to help them grow, isn't it? Well, I think there's a lot of emphasis put on giving small businesses loans, you know, looking for money for growth, etc. But quite often it's the advice that's even more important. And the chambers do a great job. The Federation of Small Businesses does a great job. Those representative bodies do a good job. But at the same time, they're representing a vast range of members. They're not actually able to stick the small business owner in front of the MPs. They're representing small businesses. And I still feel that there's nothing quite like hearing from the small business itself. Um, And, you know, that's why I'm not saying I want to talk to the MP, although I'm quite happy to (laughs) gather. But uh, what I am saying to the MPs are, look, um, is here are these people who really know what it's about at the front line. Talk to them, listen to them, listen to them. Uh, you know, the 80% of a conversation should be about listening and I should take my own advice. <laughs> but I do think that we need much, much better support in terms of mentoring, in terms of uh, practical advice. Lots of small businesses, you know, small business owner, I've often done it myself. You wake up in the middle of the night and think, ah, I need to talk to somebody, <laughs> be it all be at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's not the same as going to the bank manager and saying, I need a loan, you know. So we need to think, I think, about a better support system. No, I def- definitely agree with that because there's, there's this, sometimes it is having that support network and somebody turning around and I mean, for what I, I work with a lot of startups and as a designer, it's usually like you need a logo, website, etc. But I soon realize it's much more as, as lots of people do, that you're much more of a consultant. And there's those gaps that people are needing. Like you said, it's, it might not be anything to do with design. It's just knowing about where to go next and how to reach the market and this, that, and the other. And I guess 
with with lockdown, a lot of people had the time to, to reflect, and there was a there was these lots more conversations from the from the small businesses, wasn't there, about where they felt let down, and it was all kind of unearthed and and there to see the scars really and read those stories. So, um, you know, have, having having a way for people to have that voice and the support they need, and it, it's kind of hope, you know, it's, it's opened up that. So, uh, what what do you think will will happen from central government in terms of changing things? Well, I wish I could say I was optimistic, and I'm not sure that I necessarily am yet. I mean, we had the Kickstart scheme launched this week on Wednesday, and um, I'm a bit I'm a bit cross because right. uh, when you look at the detail of the Kickstart scheme, it's really for big businesses because you've got to be taking on 30 uh, young people kickstarting their careers before you're eligible to apply. Now, it seems to me that a lot of those big businesses are probably sitting on reserves anyway that they could release and go out there and take on board small people, uh, young people and train them and give them skills, etc. cetera, um, that would then allow them to possibly become employed within that employer. They could probably do that themselves. The small businesses have no chance of doing that. Most of them had enough reserves for 28 days when we went into lockdown. Yeah. And uh, there's something like three quarters of them, according to McKinsey's latest report, that say we won't be in existence beyond January 2021 unless we get some help. Now, if you think those even at the smallest end are three quarters of the 4.4 million self-employed and three quarters of the 1.5 million who do employ between zero and nine um, employees, that's a vast number of people uh, being thrown onto the unemployment market. Now, why did the scheme not allow them to take on and help and support them to take on some of these young people who will bring diverse thinking, new ways of working, will help a lot of the small businesses that aren't embracing digital yet yeah. to adopt digital as a way forward. That would have made a difference, but to me that just signals how the government's still thinking. And now they're talking about a new tax system. We have to think at the, look at the tax system. And I would agree with that because I think we've got a tax system that's been in existence for about 20 years that isn't fit for purpose. But we really need to think about the changes in the workforce in those 20 years. We've seen a vast increase in self-employment because people like to work that way, not because they want to avoid paying tax. That's just not what this is about. It's about flexibility. Yeah. Those people, those people, on average, earn 10% less for doing a job than they would earn for doing the same job if they were an employee. So how can it be about avoiding tax? That is just not what it's about. But we need to get that message clearly through to government when they are thinking about what the tax system needs to look like. Because if they don't encourage entrepreneurship, if they don't encourage people to take risks, if they don't encourage them to innovate, they won't be creating the jobs that we saw created in 2008 in the credit crunch. They won't be getting the unemployment figures down nearly as quickly as they'd like to. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's shaken up a lot of that and say exposed a lot of the, like the old ways of working. And you touched on a point there with like businesses not embracing digital, for example. And, and some of those businesses have seen the opportunity to look like it's it's adapt and you know survive really if we don't change the way we've always done it because oh we've always done it that way and it's always worked in the past but if you've got the new talent the, the world's moved on um if you want to take say bring on new people that have got new ideas new ways of thinking new ways of using technology or seeing opportunities um you know it's it's been able to do that and i know that we we talked also about on the phone about the, the, the difference, you know, the, the gap between education and employment and that crossover and the experience of, of learning on the job as opposed to learning something that, uh, for instance, my, my, my eldest has just done a GCSE. You learn, you know, obviously didn't do the exams for, for this year, but you learn all these things, but it's the life skills that you learn that are real. I know when I finished university many years ago, um, you know, I, I started the job, I had a good degree. And um, but I lacked a lot of the skills that were real skills, the real workplace, the real experience. And I know we have great apprenticeships now. There's, it's evolved a lot more, and and that crossover. 
Um, but there's still a lot of work to do, isn't there? And seeing that potential of encouraging people to start up their own businesses and, and know the opportunities to help their business grow. You uh, haven't known me very long, but you certainly know buttons to push. <laughs> another, another one of my bugbears, but I think it goes back even further than that. I think the Department for Education and the Department for Work and Skills or whatever it's called now uh, do need to sit down and bang a few heads together because the education system needs to know five years ahead what skills industry is going to require. Now, there are probably a lot of people out sitting out there thinking, well, hang on a minute, that wouldn't have worked now given that COVID has accelerated everything. Um, yes, and, and that is a big, big issue as far as I'm concerned, because we need this, the industry needs the skills coming out of our schools and colleges and universities that it's going to have to work with. It can fill in some of the gaps, as you say, you earn, you learn all sorts of things once you get uh, into a job. But that doesn't happen at the minute. There isn't much of an interface. Um, when I first started in broadcasting, one of the people who made a huge impression on me was a guy called Chris Humphreys, who was an Australian, who is, I hope, an Australian guy who was working for the Skills Council, perhaps. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure, but he said to me at the time, the industry and the education system do not interact with each other. So they're, we're churning out people out of the education system that aren't with skills that aren't required. They're, out, they're obsolete as soon as they hit the jobs market. Now, that has accelerated over COVID. You know, we need people with digital skills. Who knew we, you and I were going to be sitting here talking on Zoom yeah. uh, a, or Skype having a, a a podcast where normally we'd be talking in a studio. Um, there are all sorts of ways that we can uh, create a new way of working, a new working environment, a new workplace environment, but it's definitely changing and it's changing very, very quickly. It is more important than ever that we look for how we get those skills uh, created as quickly as possible. And the government keeps saying, um, yes, there will be a lot of people unemployed, but there will be lots of new jobs come along. All we need to do is transfer the unemployed people into the new jobs. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a big gap in the middle there. Yeah. How do you acquire the skills? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to advise people who are unemployed? What skills they need to retrain into in order to be uh, an important part of the future job market? Um, so we need to be thinking very, very quickly as to how we get those skills. And I come back to that point about big businesses sitting on resources that they need to think about spending on reskilling the workforce. Otherwise, we're not going to have the number of people we need yeah. to work in artificial intelligence, in knowledge management, in machine learning, all of those kind of areas that we're going to need people uh, to uh, fall into. That's the thing. I mean, it, I say it changes so quick. I and mean, we look at jobs that were... You know, there's jobs now that weren't even existing five years ago, ten years ago that, that come out. And it's I mean, we're very excited in, in Taunton. We are looking to have uh, a digital innovation center, which is for, for Taunton's future and, and Somerset's future. It, it's it's got to happen because it, the world is changing and, and it's kind of blown open everything, really, because, you know, we live in a beautiful part of the country here in Somerset. And it's the flexible working, as, as you mentioned, and people wanting to choose. Well, it's, if giving people to realise what's important and having that opportunity. What, what my um, my brother-in-law works in Canary Wharf um, in stocks and shares, and they just spent million his business it's just spent millions of pounds on a brand new office with the latest tech and stuff, and it's looking like he's probably going to be working from home for, for you know for quite a while because. Why do they need him in there? Really? <laughs> and well, there are lots of employers have realised they don't. <laughs> yeah. So those those spaces that we're going to have, like one of the things that we've we've been talking about here is the need. There's always the need for the connection and and the, you know to, to chat face to face and have the kind of um, you know the water cooler moments that that kind of help build up relationships with business and stuff. And there's going to be that 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 need to want to to have ideas and, and talk to people and interact and say, move things on because it is moving so quickly, as, as you said. And um, that is, I think that is the key is, is seeing that, that kind of gulf between the two as, as more of a kind of, 
you know, one and this as, as being one of the same and, and much of a crossover in terms of, of, like I say, learning the skills and having the opportunity to do things and, and start a business, but have that support knowing that it's not such as a, as a big leap. I mean, when I started my business, I, I, a friend of mine was, was employed and I tried to get him to, to maybe discuss getting into business with me. He was terrified. Um, you know, he was like, oh God, it's the risk, the risk factor. And he got made redundant in the first kind of three or four years um, that I was employed. Um, so it's nearly nearly self-employed. It's kind of nearly 10 years. And, and more people are seeing that if you can adapt, if you've got a business like I found during this time where, you know, the main part of our business got put on hold because we couldn't do it. You've got that opportunity to adapt and embrace new things. So me doing this today, talking to you today, I couldn't do this six months ago. I didn't really know the kit. But... But knowing it's there, knowing there's opportunities and upskilling people to do new things, it's, it's, it's surely we've got to, yeah, we've got to just make that the key, really, isn't it, out of all of this? Well, I think we do. But I also think we've, um, so it, two points, I suppose, that come out of that. There's the opportunities that arise for people who are able to work from home and can work from home and can be really productive and effective from home. We have got to remember, though, that there are people for whom working from home is just not a great option. It's too busy, there's too many, you know, the children are around, there's too many distractions, there's not enough room. Uh, the number of young people living in shared accommodation, working from the end of the bed, yeah. is, quite, uh, is quite astronomical. And so I'm seeing a lot of the organisations that I work with going for a hybrid model where they're starting now to make it the office available. If people want to get back to the office, then that's great. They can do that. Uh, the safety measures have been put in place. But equally, there is an acceptance that you don't necessarily have to have everybody in the office at the same time. But ideas are definitely sparked when people are sparking off uh, each other. So I think we'll see a different working model that will evolve over the next a uh, couple of years. I don't think we're going back to the big offices with the big atriums. It's not needed and we have to think about what we need to do with that space. Um, but the, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a project, there's a, a system in Belgium that I just heard about this week where landlords are being heavily penalised through the tax system if they leave premises empty on their high streets. Right. That, and th there's a landlord problem here, especially for small businesses, because there are a lot of small businesses saying, we no longer need the office, we don't need to move into bigger space, we'll keep the small one we've got. What are we going to do with all those empty premises? Landlords being resistant to uh, reducing rents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So landlords have got to play a bit of thinking in this. And of course, a lot of landlords in the UK are local authorities. Hmm. They're strapped for cash. They need to be getting in every penny they possibly can. So that's difficult too. So there's a huge big jigsaw that has got to be put in place here. So there's the skills, there's the premises, there's the working environment we're going to be working in. And, and there is, you know, where the jobs are going to come from uh, in the future. And everything is going to change much more quickly. The other problem, of course, that we've got and it's less of a problem perhaps than it was, is that the broadband infrastructure doesn't always meet demand. <laughs> and this certainly has happened even in central London and throughout lockdown, that we you know, haven't necessarily been able to connect when we wanted to. So we really need to get that right. There's a lot of rural businesses really struggling with this new way of working simply because the broadband infrastructure isn't great. And I was dismayed to read a report this week that said we've the UK has fallen 13 places in broadband speed. We're now number 47 in the world, the slowest. Oh, that's... <laughs> you know, how many times have we heard this? We've got to really think about our infrastructure. Now, the government's talking about building bridges. I think we need to build businesses first before we start building bridges. No, and, and I think, well, we've certainly had the, the issue at the moment with, uh, you know, having Exmoor in West Somerset, you know. I'm, I'm from Minehead originally, and I mean, Exmoor is a remote, remote place and the connectivity there obviously look, needs a lot of work. But just in doing these in these these videos throughout lockdown, it's been people that say that some sometimes they're in towns and you know that that it's just really really poor. And I know people that they've uh, had to upgrade to their their system they've got, 
And um, interesting, you said about working from home. A lot of my friends are now getting uh, now getting dogs because they're able to work from home and finally have a, a, a dog that they can have. And, and so I'm getting loads of pressure from my kids now. Well, you've got no excuse now if you can kind of work between the office and home. You know, I've never seen so many puppies in my <laughs> life. Uh, all, all absolutely beautiful. I just suffer from. I've got a dog, but I do suffer from dog envy yeah. when I take him. I'm, I'm feeling the, the pressure now, and um, but on the on the broadband, I know that the um, the chambers here in, in Taunton, Somerset, uh, Somerset Chamber, when I was talking to them, and the FSB are really banging the drum now about connectivity. And one thing that really struck me was there was there we had a um, we had a a business convention in Taunton about I must be four maybe five years ago that was run by the council, and a load of people up there, and it was talking about the future of Taunton and what we're doing and this tell the other. And this this is something that really got me. So the guys who are watching this that I know from the, the um, uh, Digital Taunton, um, there was a few of us there. And we used to be in, we used to have an office in central Taunton opposite County Hall, and we didn't even have fiber. And we are trying to run digital businesses. Now, they look at the building as, as oh, there's a building there, there's a building there, there's a building there. But we had like six or seven businesses within ours that were all kind of digital, web design, you know, uh, everything like that. And... We listened to this conference and I could feel as we were going, everything was about infrastructure, about roads and connectivity. And then the guy who stood up said, oh, hi there, here's my slide. Let's talk about roads and what we're doing with the, you know, A303, et cetera, et cetera. And it's almost like, oh, I'm also responsible for digital stuff. Oh, we haven't got time for that. And I was like, and this was about four or five years ago. And I could feel myself like my blood boiling. Well, we are in the county town and we have fiber and nobody seems to be talking to us like you said at a, a ground level about the challenges we've got and actually our local mp um rebecca powell she came in came in she did come in and have a look have a chat with us and we said we are in we are opposite county hall county town of somerset and we are struggling with a hamster that's powering our internet <laughs> so at this at this i this, love it. i love that picture but uh, yeah. sadly, sadly, you know, we have advanced to a certain point, but we, there's still a lot to be done. Admittedly, that you know, there are lots of small businesses in rural areas will really sympathise with the fact that the roads, the connectivity in terms of transport needs to be better. Yeah. Uh, access to cash, for instance, and banking services and financial services are vitally important to many, many small businesses. And without the transport connectivity, yeah, and I think I think that that was that more difficult, and we're seeing brand flows and so on. Yeah. So we've got to really get the digital in place before we start taking all the other bits away, because yeah. otherwise yeah. you've got excluded people. They're excluded digitally, but they're also excluded financially. And small businesses need that financial inclusion and in those services. And I, and I, yeah, I completely agree. And I think I think on that day when we had that convention, and uh, uh, guy Shane Griffiths, who's, who's who's one of the founders of the Digital Tauntons, actually stood up, and it was amazing because I was like so pent up about it. And he said, um, "I've I've heard you talk about this for hours now about roads and this day and the other, and kind of like the elephant in the room was like, what is, what's your plan for digital?" And they all sort of went, uh, and it just sparked a massive conversation afterwards, and we were all talking about what needed to be done. And what's been great now is those conversations are happening, but they say we're behind from where we should be. But they're happening. Behind it's the exciting curve. if we get this digital innovation center, there's good stuff happening with the colleges. The apprenticeships are very good and advanced. Um, I'm gonna be speaking to a few people about that, but it has kind of taken the, the kind of bandaid off, hasn't it, uh, of what needs to be done and what's missing. But I think it's back to that whole point about the fact that we've got MPs who've they weren't born digital. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we've got we've got to get some diversity into the whole system. And I think that that includes the Houses of Parliament. You know, we need you try to connect in the Houses of Parliament and find out how difficult it is. Um, you know, we need you need young people in there with different thinking. You need diversity of all sorts. You need, uh, you know, people with disabilities running businesses. You need people of color running businesses. All of that diversity of thinking needs to be across not just businesses themselves but actually yeah. uh, in the houses of parliament amongst the policy makers in the civil service uh, and i think we're still really lacking on that diversity front we need to think about and not just diversity but also inclusivity because if we don't include people 
yeah. of, from all sorts of different backgrounds in the, the thinking processes and with the ideas and the development of those ideas, etc. We're really missing a big trick here. And I was shocked this morning to realize that uh, the US has got 13% of its workforce are black people and Amazon and Google are each employing somewhere around about three and a half percent of their workforce from that black, uh, from people with, uh, you know, come from ethnic minority backgrounds. Mm. There's something wrong here. We're not making uh, the right recruitment decisions in order to get the right thinking uh, included in the way we do business. And I think, yeah, that, and when when the kind of Black Lives Matters thing was, you know, was in the news and was very current, there was the people were really pulled up on some of the big business like Apple and think about that that lack of diversity and and just yeah, just how far we've got to go and you know, and not just not just pander into whatever's trending online, but actually to make actual changes. And I think, but we have to be inclusive as well. It's no, it's not good enough just to be diverse. We've got to think about inclusivity. I mean, I've I've worked with boards in the city who say, oh well, we've got thirty percent women on our boards. Uh, yes, but actually, they're really lucky if they get five percent of the speaking time. Yeah, <laughs> and five percent of the feeding into ideas. There's no point in paying lip service. We've got to have real inclusivity and it's got to get embedded into the way we think about how uh, we run our businesses, about into our recruitment processes. Um, we've got to have difficult conversations. These conversations are not easy to have necessarily. Yeah. We've got to be brave enough to say, we're not getting this right. Help us to put it right. Yeah, and it, it's not always about chucking money and grants at people. It's yeah. it's actually a mind changing the mindset of actually, well, let's just, Re reorder how we're doing things because otherwise we're just chucking money that's not going to be used or make any real difference and, and one of my big worries is that you know when we start when the furlough scheme comes to an end and we start seeing people more people you know the redundancies accelerate yeah. etc and we're really looking at you know conservative estimates i think are two and a half million unemployed it could be a lot more than that but i'm worried that we will see more of those employees with disabilities more employees from uh, black and minority ethnic uh, groups being made redundant, uh, which I would, I hate, I would really like to be proved wrong. Yeah. But if that is the case, then there's a lot of people with great skills coming out into the workforce who will want to set up as self-employed. Yeah. They'll want to set up small businesses, and we've really got to look at what those people are going to need in order to get them going and get them thriving. No, def definitely. And I say, do, going going back to to the back in business and the, the support that you've got there so that we've got obviously the podcast that people can help there the blog the blogs and the resources and how, how can people get involved or how can they you know what's there for them to, to, to well, use um come along and give your contributions uh, i really want to hear from businesses right across the uk people who want to start up we're starting up uh, our usual uh, format blogs again come the 18th of September. We want to look at startups. Who's starting up and how are they doing it and what practical advice can you give? Everybody who works with working business uh, is earning their money elsewhere. <laughs> They're yeah. all giving their services on a pro bono basis. Um, and there are some business journalists who uh, are, um, I'm sure they won't mind me saying, uh, me included, a bit long in the tooth. But then we have got uh, everything through to university graduates coming out with skills, digital skills that are helping us to do our podcasts, etc. But we are doing all of this with partners. We're not creating original content if uh, if that content already exists. We're linking up with partners in order to bring as much contact, as many links as possible to people that, as we possibly can. And so if you've got really good content, then I want a link on my site to your really good content. You know, we want to be able to just um, be able to uh, people to come onto the site and be able to get where they need to get to. At the minute, for instance, we're we've got a a mental health group uh, of people who are looking at what mental health resources we might need to have uh, links to on the site. Again, we're not producing it from scratch. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but there's a lot of small business people really feeling the isolation of the lockdown. Uh, really finding that their mental health has been affected. 
and negatively affected. And so I think that's another issue that we're going to see over the next few years. People are going to need a lot of help with. And if we can point people in the right direction, then so be it. Yeah, well, I've, my mind's going already, Liz, about people that I know locally. So I'll certainly get in touch with people that can add loads of value to that to that end and, and expertise and ideas. Um, so there's some, there's some good things happening here uh, in Somerset. There always is. Um, it's, it's an exciting time for digital, but anybody that I know, yeah. we're very keen to get more involved. I, think, I guess the key is collaboration, isn't it? Us all working together the, for the same thing, um, wanting the same outcome. So, no, it's, it's, it's a great initiative. I'm really glad um, for, your, for your time today. I'm really lovely to speak to you um, and would love to speak to you some more. Uh, put people your way, get in touch, have some conversation. Great. And uh, so, Liz, thank you, thank you so much for, for joining me today, and I look forward to speaking to you very soon. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I always love when you're a broadcaster uh, and have been for 20 odd years. Sometimes it's nice to be the person who gets to talk rather than the person who just asks the yeah. question. Yeah, no, so I as get you that. Can tell, I'm always really pleased to be uh, able to have a conversation like this. It would be great. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for much. And if I if I get a dog in the near future, I'll let you know. Let me know. Please let me know. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Okay, Liz, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me.